this one of those marble endings? That <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's alive. He didn't die or anything. It's not like a loving memory or anything like that. Okay. We can kill it. We, we can kill it. All right. There we go. Uh, hey, everybody. How about a big round of applause for... Frank, Samir, Jeremy, Pablo, Trayvon. For their amazing film. Uh, first things first, Jeremy, how does it feel to, to watch yourself on tape? Is that a weird thing? Because it, it's very strange for me to watch myself on tape. Is that a weird... How does it feel to do this film and be a part of it? Um, yeah, it's, it's weird because I had a documentary before, and but I never sat in like a movie theater to watch it. Yeah. Um, it was supposed to be just a YouTube video. <laughs> and then uh, the insanity happened and it turned into a doc, but to be in a movie theater, um, it just felt different. Um, to watch it with you guys. This is my second time watching it. Uh, yesterday was my first time, and so um, it was just different to be able to experience this, but uh, yeah, it, it hit home differently. When you saw it yesterday, what did it feel like? What was that first moment? Did, you didn't see any of the cut? That was your first time seeing it? That, through, that was my first wow. time. Um, that was my first time watching yesterday because uh, the last time I did a documentary, I was so sick of watching it by the end because I did the cuts. <laughs> so I watched it like 20 times. And then by the end, I was tired of it. So yesterday, I was like, that was my first time. And um, I almost cried. And I've never cried watching anything, like no show, movie, or anything. But especially when the little girl was talking, um, that's when, for me, it really hit differently. Um, and and uh, uh, But yeah, it was a special experience. Um, Frank, Trayvon, Samir, why don't we get into the idea for the film? Why that particular night at the garden? Just tell us the genesis of how this all came together. Sure. Hey, and I just wanted to say thank you for using me more than Ronnie Chang. I really appreciate that. <laughs> that, that, that I, and, and, and I will be using this as friend equity with all of you. Because <laughs> I just want you to know I'm here. <laughs> and Ronnie's not. But let's get let's get into the idea, the genesis of it. <laughs> um, so can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. The birth of this idea really came uh, with a conversation that Trayvon and I were having in 2020 about impossible moments, right? What is a moment that society at large tells a certain group of people it's impossible for you to do something, and then out of nowhere, somebody comes in and just shatters that into pieces. And we're both big Obama people, so we were like, well, obviously that's objectively the biggest impossible moment any of us have lived through. And we're like, what other moments feel like that? And I was like, <laughs> Well, I'm Asian, so that's a pretty easy answer for me. It's Linsanity. And I proceeded to tell Trayvon about the, my night when Jeremy scored 30 points at the Garden. Um, I was living in D.C. at the time, and I trained up to New York to try to get in the game, and scalpers in front of the, the Garden were like, $700, kid, for nosebleeds. Okay, and I'm, I don't have $700. Okay, so I'm like, okay, Koreatown's like right there. Um, I'm just gonna go to Koreatown, go to one of like the karaoke bars and just pop myself down in front of the bar and just watch it that way. And looking back on it, I, <laughs> Jeremy, as much as I would have loved to watch you play in the garden, I don't think I would have traded that experience for anything else because I was surrounded by people who look like me, who are around my age, who were maybe a little bit older. And I mean, you all saw the game, it's not like he's was good for five minutes or a half, like he was good the entire game. So you had two hours of people just losing their shit, okay? And like, you know, I, obviously I'm doing the same thing as well, but like I'm watching this happen and people were like sing, uh, not sing, but they were like dancing, they were like, you know, cheering, they were crying. And I was like, okay, is this a combination of like the stereotypes that we all have to deal with our whole lives? Is it like, I don't know, like a cathartic reaction to the internal family pressures we all had to deal with? Is it a combination of both? I don't know. But it was really one of those moments where I was like, man, I've never felt this way. Maybe the only other moment I felt this way was when the night when Barack Obama got elected president. So I was like, okay, um, I, I need to like log this into my memory. And I read as like the game was about to end. It was obvious the Knicks were gonna win. Jeremy was worth 38 points. This guy is like three, four people down from me. He's like weeping to his beer. He just slams the table and just runs out the door. Wow. And like usually, like the bartender's like gotta be like, 
get him back here. He needs to pay for his tab. <laughs> the guy didn't even say anything, right? It was that kind of night. And so I tell Trayvon this story. He was like, man, like, why, why haven't you made this from a, into a movie? Like, why, like, Linsanity from the Asian fan's perspective? And I'll tell you, I mean, look, y'all saw the movie. Like, the first part of this movie is called The Dao. Yeah. Right? The first thing I did was Dao. Sure. Right? I was like... I, be I bet you if a Hollywood studio had the Linsanity movie script and then Air Bud the movie script, <laughs> they'd be like, this is more believable. I think... <laughs> I think this dog playing basketball and beating everybody is more <laughs> has less of a leap of faith than the, yeah I agree. So so Trayvon, Samir, how does this? He he tells you this passionate story about a, a guy who doesn't pay his bar tab. And, and how does now now how does the ideation process start? I mean, it was to me it was hearing that story. It was so painfully obvious that he was not the only person who had that experience. Yeah. And so I'm like, bro, 38th the Garden, like that's the movie. Like, you know, we we, we, we go back, you know, yeah. like it's, it synthesizes quickly. It's like, yeah. here's a title, here's an idea, like, <laughs> right. go make a thing. Yeah. And so he processed it for a few weeks and then yeah. came back and was like, all right, so I think I want to do it. <laughs> and we, he made a deck. I sent the deck to Samir and I'm like, Samir knows every like athlete on the planet. And so I'm like, Samir, can you get this to Jeremy? And he facilitates the whole getting us to Jeremy. And then we like date Jeremy for six months, trying to get him to say yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was definitely, you know, playing hard to get. He didn't, you know, he, he was still processing it himself. And so um, we finally like made that connection and we, we got on a call with him. And like, thank, thank God, like he said, yeah, because we we're all sitting here like right now getting to do this. I mean, Samir, one of the things I got to say, man, is is the way Iman and and Tyson are so great in this film. Tell, tell us a little bit about getting a hold of them and, and them giving these amazing sound bites. Holy shit, Iman Shumper, it's no, so no, funny. It, it, was, it was harder to get Jeremy. Jeremy, <laughs> <laughs> it was easier getting the first day with my wife than it was <laughs> Jeremy. It, it was, Jeremy was like a six month process. It literally was wow. like, Courting. It was like through a friend, through Danny Green, through Jeremy, through Patricia, back to Jeremy, the slam, to Jeremy. I was like, oh, okay. Wait, Jeremy, did you think they were running some sort of like multi level marketing scam or something? Like they're trying to make you shill Bitcoin or something? Or what? Man, I just, I spent so much work on the previous documentary. So when I heard documentary, I was like, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, but I'll let them finish the story. Yeah. No, but, but you know, getting him, and, and finally, you know, we had. Three Zooms, we had a prayer meeting, and you know, we, we were finally able to be able to really come to a point in time when it was just like, you know, he believed in us, you know what I mean? I think, because we all believed in, in Frank's vision. And then from there, it was literally like, yo, what do we need to do to be able to, one, get the money to do it? And we found, you know, Dave Lou, shout out to Dave Lou, who was able to bring the community around this to be able to get this done. And, and then after that happened, it was it was really to the to race to the finish. I mean, Tyson and Chump, you know, they were they were very gracious with their time um, because they remember that, and they never recanted this story in this way. So it was just phenomenal. But being able to, you know, get Jeremy to be able to open it up about this, I think probably for the first time was really the like the the, the special sauce, man. The three three interviews in, appreciate that. Oh my God, I don't even want to talk about that process. <laughs> Pablo, tell us a little bit about this project specifically, what it meant to you and how you got involved and, and, and why, as, as a person who covers sports day in and day out, why this moment obviously you know, stood out to you so much. Yeah, I think part of the reason Jeremy was probably cautious about signing up to work with anyone is because people like me had been hounding him for a decade. I mean, I covered him when he was a senior at Harvard and so I was a barnacle on his leg when, when sanity happened. This is no joke. Me knowing and having interviewed his parents was something that the New York tabloids all wanted and they were not cooperating with any of those non-Asian people. And so it was me in these buildings. Like at, at one point I was watching a Columbia basketball game sitting between Spike Lee and your dad. And I was like, oh, this is pretty weird, <laughs> you know? And so the story to me, it, it was, I've been, I was telling Jeremy this before we walked in, but I was like, I've been waiting for this day in some form for a decade. It was very obvious to me. Like I, that box score I held up is the actual box score that they handed the media members. Like I was like, I'm keeping this shit. Like this is not going anywhere. 
And, and the last thing I'll say about just the, the power of this story as a sports story, I was interviewing uh, Mike Breen, who is calling the NBA Finals, going on right now, um, who has called more NBA Finals than anyone ever has, who is the play-by-play -play guy for the Knicks. And I asked him, you know, like, favorite moment in your career? And he said, Linsanity. Like, he has called Ray Allen's shot in game six of the finals in 2013. He has seen everything. He was at the mouths of the palace. He's seen the spectrum of sports, success and failure. And he returns, even for non-Asian people is my point. Even people have seen everything and they see this and they're like, this was fucking special. Trayvon, we've covered, you know, working together at The Daily Show, we cover politics all the time and it, you know how divisive and exhausting that can be. Yeah. Um, what is the power of sports and its ability to tell stories? That it can both be this unifying, secular thing that everybody can get into, and then you're able to tell these really unique, special stories. Um, obviously, you have gotten a chance to now work on that side as well. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about sports is it immediately takes off all the stuff the world has put on you. You don't you don't think about what color someone is. You don't think about what politics have told you about a certain group of people. All you care about is like, my team wins. I want my team to win. If the black guy's on my team, he better make every fucking basket. If Jeremy Lin's on my team, make I don't, he better make every basket. And it, it allows people to cheer for people in a way that they don't in real life. Like you don't go around if you're being told like Republican this, Democrat that, just cheering for people. It's the only place where we do that, where, I mean, you look at movies like Remember the Titans and all this stuff, like it's the, in Alabama, they love football so much. The whole team's black. When they're on that field, there's a stadium full of white people who probably don't necessarily wanna hang out with them, cheering for them, for their success. When they leave that place, different story. Sports is the only thing that does that. And so when you see someone like Jeremy do what he does, it, it feeds into that same power of stripping away all the shit. And you just see a person being excellent, being amazing, and hopefully wearing your team's jersey when they do it. Jeremy, you know, it, it's one of those things where, one of the things I think is so kind of confusing and vexing about living the time, living in the times that we live right now, a lot of times we try to write history as it's happening. Social media definitely gets people doing that. You're, you're trying to write the story or write history in real time as it's happening. I think what's so beautiful about watching this movie and watching you and, and getting a chance to meet you now, now it's been 10 years since that moment. Is there anything that you look back on that time did you even realize what was happening at the time? Or was it just one of those things where you were just, you did not realize that kind of history was changing and, and things would be different after that? I definitely had no idea in terms of the impact. Um, you know, I, I spent my whole life trying to be great at basketball because on the basketball court, my skin color didn't matter. And then finally, when I was good at basketball, the only thing people want to talk about was my skin color. Mm. And so it went from a safe haven to like, you guys just took away my safe haven. And that is, you know, that's a big part of why it was hard for me to make the documentary for me to right. talk about the story. And so even in the moment, I was like, you guys are missing uh, like, a, like an artist make art on a court. And that's because all I knew for racism was like when people would call me a chink during the games or make fun of my eyes or, you know, this stuff happened all the time. And that was like racism to me, but I didn't understand microaggressions. I didn't understand systemic, you know, injustice. I didn't even understand Asian American history or even history, like American history, the way they teach it is not American history. Like the actual history that, you know, we should be learning is not what we're learning. And so as I started to understand that something that I was running away from I started to really embrace and that's a big reason why we wanted to make this but I had no idea in the moment at all that this was happening after the Laker game we jumped on a plane flew straight to Minnesota and we played the next night and that's the only thing I was thinking about right. but I didn't understand all this other stuff that was happening and it wasn't you know it's been literally like a, a decade-long process of me trying to understand what it meant like when COVID really hit in New York at that time was really going through it the Knicks were like, we need to cheer up the city. 
They didn't use Ewing or Frazier. They didn't use anything. They had an insanity week. And they called me and they're like, will you do a bunch of PR and do a bunch of, and I was like, are you kidding me? Like your whole franchise history, your city is in the worst like place that it's been in a while. And you're going to go to the insanity week. Like those are kind of some of the moments that made me realize like, hey, like I think you've been seeing it too narrow minded. Yeah. Listen, man, I mean, I just want to give you your flowers because to me, moments in history, things that are singular in nature, everything before it seems obsolete, everything after it bears its fingerprints. And that, that moment in 2012, whether you know it or not, everything that comes after this, it'll be linked to that point in time. So the way comedians or artists, we all pay homage to the Richard Pryors and the George Carlins, and we're all children of that, or we're, Trayvon and I are children of John Stewart, and you see that, and myself, or Trevor Noah, and all of us, those moments in both popular culture and sports, you were a part of that. And so I'm, I'm, I just want to say thank you for being a part of this and, and putting yourself on camera. Uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, yeah. and I need your flowers too, because I didn't tell you this, but uh, when, you, when you performed in San Jose not too long ago, uh -huh. I was there. Oh my God, you came? <laughs> yeah, I got tickets right in the fourth row, but I was like, I'm not gonna say, I just wanna go and enjoy You went to Ticketmaster.com and you paid $50 or $30. It was, it was oh top place, God. I had to go redeem ticket, all that, but uh, wow. no, I went and I think, uh, no, seriously, like watching him do his thing, to use your word, right. big dick energy is what you yeah. 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 It's like to go after what the people that you're going after and yeah. your thing, like, so again, like, I think this, crew right here yeah. is special and I think the fact that Trayvon and Samir are willing to tell this story like Tyson and Chandler people that is not just you know it is cross-racial solidarity there's a lot of things going on that this team has been trying to do but this panel right here is like and this project um I mean I guess I'm just completely hijacking the Q&A but I'm just saying I wanted to say thank you to you guys uh for telling the story um, one more thing I wanted to uh, tell you before we get out of here and we end this. A, a thing that people overlook within your story is also your story going back to you winning a state championship. From 2003, the first time I was able to see you play basketball, your story's been a story of grit, determination, and overcoming what people put on you. And I know there's been stuff written about you, the various chapters of your career. I'm saying this on behalf of every Asian American kid that's been cut from the basketball team. Everybody gets cut. Like, every, everybody's story's at. My story ended in 10th grade. His may have ended at a certain point. Trayvon's may have ended at a certain point. Everybody's story has ended at a certain point. But what's been beautiful to see is that is, is your grit and determination on every, at every level. And I can't wait to see how you apply that grit and determination to everything else in your life. Because um, we're not even at halftime, this thing called life. So I think that's the message that you give in front of you. Know I, mean? you know, I, I, know, I don't know when you got cut. Mine was 15, you know? <laughs> Around that time. Right. But, but it's, it was, it was that, um, that's what I find to be most inspiring, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm moderating. I'm sorry. I thought someone else was going to talk about that. I was, I was just having a genuine moment. I was like, I've always wanted to tell him that. And, I appreciate and I it. Like, I appreciate um, it. Frank, tell us a little bit more about how it's been for you as a director helming this. And, and one of the things I got to say to both you and Trayvon is seeing you guys create such amazing work. Trayvon, you've been in a flow, man, these past two years. It's been very nice. Uh, what, what has it been about this time that his... Obviously, the world has gone through a global pandemic, but I think the creativity that has come out during these past two years between my contemporaries and colleagues has been incredible. Frank, do you feel part of that, the darkness of COVID birthed this, this project? Like, did that oh, pressure make 100%. you? 100%. Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, one of the first things that when we all started this conversation with Jeremy, Jeremy was like, I, I don't want this story to be about right like if it can be about the community because this is such an awful time like that's the power of the story and you know i was i described if you were to take the sports out of this whole story right you would probably describe it this way the first part of the movie is about stereotypes the second part of the story is about what happens when someone comes out of nowhere and just shatters all those stereotypes into pieces and the third part is about today 
when those stereotypes have been weaponized. And I think that's a really important reminder for people in that like, when we see something like Linsanity happen, try to understand the context as much as possible so that you can understand what's happening now. I mean, we're reliving my favorite memory as an Asian American during what is the worst time to be Asian American in recent history. And I mean, I think about, somebody asked me earlier, like who, who this film is for? And I was like, you know, is it like a millennial nostalgia film? Is it for me? Is it for everybody in their mid to late thirties who like love this moment? Or is it for like the kids that are like maybe eight or nine years old that obviously were not around during Linsanity, but every single day their parents send them to school and they tell them not to make a lot of noise, not to bring attention to yourself. What you said in the movie, right? Somebody's gonna call you Kung Flu, someone's gonna call you China virus. You know, that is, look, I grew up without those stereotypes being weaponized. And it was really hard for me. I can't imagine what it's like for be those kids now without stories about hope, telling you you can do anything, anything is possible. Right, and, and those are the things that I think our society, whether it's the algorithm burying hope as an as a emotion or whatnot, I mean, those are the stories that we are missing from our, from our storytelling right now. Yeah, I also feel like, I don't know if you felt this when I, when I watched this, to me, this is also a uniquely American story. My favorite American stories are, are, you know, are the ones that are built by renegades and trailblazers. And whether it's Linsanity or Black Panther, or get out. There's all these moments that I that I have etched in my mind in pop culture where I'm watching TV and I'm like, there's no way this is happening. Holy shit, this is happening. Like when I Trayvon, when I saw you win an Oscar, I'm like, this isn't happening. This is fucking happening. Like it's this, um, and it and what it does is it changes. It, it kind of changes your own brain chemistry. Right. Where you're like, yo, I've been looking at the world completely the wrong way. All these doors that I thought were closed, I could just like, oh shit, I could just open it. Right. You know, and so I, I think it is only in America where yes. that type of um, energy, bravado, and that risk taking is encouraged. And um, it's so cool that you guys have documented this very unique, beautiful American story. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Five. We have five. You want to do audience? Yeah, let's do audience. Yeah, we got five minutes. Yeah, let's open up to the audience. Was there anything when you started the project and sort of the direction you thought it might go? Like, what kind of change? Like, as you got into the process, where like it ended up in the film, where you may not have originally thought it was going to go in that process when you started. Is there anything you can think of? Um, you know, this project has taught me a lot about. I mean, obviously, I feel the way I feel about insanity from ten years ago to now, right? Um, but I learned a lot about how other people felt, especially Asian Americans. Like what Hassan says, like about the Toronto buzzer beater. The wave off is one of the biggest. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but like I, I still I never, use that with my friends. I never felt that. Way. I mean, I I didn't explain it like that. I mean, I and I think you know the way Pablo talks about like the visceral reaction of feeling included. Like I think I did feel that way. I just never actually verbalized it that way. Um, so it was a learning process. I mean, after every interview. I mean, you can tell, I mean, every person we interviewed said it from the heart, right? Um, I, I learned something new about a topic that I thought I was pretty pretty good at, right? And I think that's one of the, especially, look, if you're making an interview-based documentary, these are the things that you have to open yourself to. You can't just be like, walk in and be like, okay, I have this story to tell. If you don't say it, bye, right? You got, you got to let people talk. Um, and who knows where the documentary leads, but I think, you know, we all had the same goal, which was to, to make a piece that made us all feel more included. And I think that goal stayed the same. In the back. Did you choose the supporting voices for the documentary? You're like talking about the, the next super fans? Everybody. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of it, the, the comedians, like Trayvon has a comedian background, right? So a lot of the comedians are, are folks, his friends, so we tapped into that. Um, and I think obviously uh, from from a, an athlete standpoint, Shump and Tyson being Jeremy's former teammates, like that made the most sense. And obviously we had a bunch of Knicks super fans and they were, they were awesome. 
Um, but everybody, everybody had a like, had, had a very unique way. Is it my is it my mom? Ronnie heard what you said. Sal, you got Ronnie heard what I said. said and he's calling. I'll say it with my chest. Yeah. Put it on the record. Ronnie, you're on the phone. Ronnie, you're on the phone. What's up? Hey, what's up? Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm supporting my friends. Are you are you shooting eighth lead on a Disney Plus show? <laughs> I'm, I'm out here in Hawaii working. Will you? Will, you oh, good. Oh, good. No, no, no. I'm in New York City with the working class people. You're in Hawaii vacationing. <laughs> I, I know for a fact you got the invite, Ronnie. I know you did. Do not, do not gaslight these people right now. <laughs> and Ronnie, I just want you to know, you, you, I know you didn't see the, I, I know you didn't watch the movie. I did. I watched both the, 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 the link that they emailed me and I watched it in the theater. And one of the things I take such great pride in is the fact that I'm in the movie more than you. Your thoughts? Ronnie, you're going way too deep of it. You're doing, you're doing really big. Don't do this. Don't do this. You're, we're, I want to stop Asian hate. We need to stop Asian hate. And if we, if we all hate each other, this is a problem. Okay, thank you, Ronnie Chang. Ronnie Chang, ladies and gentlemen. Ronnie Chang, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lesson about tonight, which is about defying expectations. Remember, Ronnie Chang told me to continue to play cricket, even though I don't like cricket. <laughs> and I will gladly play cricket to kick the Britishers' ass as a, as a, as a big middle finger to colonialism. But anyways, um, <laughs> thank you for, for, for having Ronnie uh, come in and hijack the Q&A. That, that was a good supporting voice. Let's do one, let's do one last question. Let's get out of here. Uh, yeah, bottom. Um, so, Jeremy, this is a question for you. You're one of my huge inspirations whenever I'm like studying and feeling down. I'll pull up your highlights and just chug through that for an hour ish. Who's someone that you really look up to um, when you were trying to motivate yourself through that really difficult time of making it into the league? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I love the idea of just watching Jeremy highlights before a test. <laughs> I relate to that. Energy. I don't like pop quizzes. Um, the I think the my answer is a big reason why we're here. Um, my answer is, and I tell my family this all the time. Like I did book reports on Jordan, or I saw Yao Ming when he played for the Rockets, and was you know by nosebleeds at Golden State. But like truly inspiration, like I didn't really. Like I never, like in the most crucial moments, it was really just my faith, um, scripture and prayer. But like in terms of like, I didn't have somebody that really did what I was going for before me. And the closest inspiration, this is why I wear this clothes all the time, it's Naruto. Um, and I, it's, it's an anime, right? And the reason why I watch Naruto is because it, it inspires me because I feel that energy his personality, like exactly what he feels, exactly what I feel. I think that's why we need to do something like this is because, I, you know, honestly, growing up, nobody looked like me that was trying to do what I wanted to do. Um, and I think that's a big part of it. I mean, again, Yao Ming is different, right? Like I'm not seven six and, and I'm Asian American and, and there's a lot of, you know, and, and so I drew some inspiration, but it wasn't like, hey, I'm going through it. I'm going to pull up his highlights. Like, he's seven, six, dunking on people. I'm <laughs> six, two, three, born, born and raised in California. Um, so it is different. Frank, um, I know it was recently announced that uh, the film that you just saw has been picked up by HBO. Um, uh, how this film is going to be seen by the world. So, um, it's gonna hit HBO this fall. And, uh, but before that, we're gonna make sure that we run through a list of the Asian American film festivals so that the community gets to see this first. And then come the beginning of the new NBA season, we will, this will be seen by everybody. 
on HBO. So be on the lookout. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get a big round of applause.